The following interview uh, was conducted with Professor Christian Chris Johansson, Professor Emeritus of Agronomy for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Wednesday, February 3, 2010 in Stewart Center. Uh, he is also the Director Emeritus of the Laboratory for Applications of Remote Sensing Laws. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome and good afternoon. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Tell us a little bit about where you were born and your parents in early years. Okay. Uh, I was born July 24, 1937 in Randolph, Nebraska, which is in the northeast part of Nebraska. And we moved to Bloomfield, Nebraska in 1943, where my father had purchased a farm. And it was a grain livestock farm, only 160 acres. But uh, we seemed to manage quite well on that. As I got a little bit older and into high school, why? We added uh, an additional 160 acres that we rented, so that was that was my start. Okay. Well, tell us about grade school and high school. Were there uh, any clubs and athletics or any teachers that made an impact on you? Yes. Um, actually, grade school, I attended a one-room schoolhouse. And I for how many? For eight grades? Was for eight, eight grades. And uh, what was interesting is that all eight grades were taught all eight of those years. There were about 30 to 40 kids going to that one-room schoolhouse. And I tell my sons that it took me eight years to pass the first grade. It, uh, but it was a... It's actually in one, one room. One room. I mean, I, I still can't imagine... That a, te- that a teacher would be able to, you know, keep control of everything and, and get everything taught because there were three of us in my grade and we were together the whole time and you had to pass an exam in order to get into high school in those days in Nebraska. And uh, we came out one, first, second, and fourth in terms of ranking of the people that took the exam for the whole county. So uh, they were doing a good job. Surely were, yeah. So that... uh, That's interesting. Was it close to your home? Could you walk to school? It was two and a half miles. Okay. And I walked a half a mile to the the main highway, and my father had arranged for the Greyhound bus to pick up my brother and I for five cents, which took us the other two miles. And then we walked home. In the afternoon. Oh, so. interesting. That's very nice. <laughs> yes. One room, you know. I went to, when we moved to the east side, I went to a small school. They were building the new one for grade school, and it had, there was eight grades, but there were four, there were four rooms, so they had them split that way, oh. which was interesting, you know. Right. We had several people that rode horses in, and they had a separate barn for the horses. What a wonderful memory. That's it, great. It, it is. It really fun. is nice. Yeah, <laughs> it really is. In today's times, it means a lot. Then, so tell us a little about high school. High school, um, I, uh, I attended Bloomfield High School. There were about uh, 200 students in the high school. The community of Bloomfield uh, has about 1,450 people, so it's a small town. It's one of those places where you know everyone, and they know a lot about you. I was I was active in uh, the Future Farmers of America, or FFA, as it's called today. Also active in in 4-H. Uh, so I dealt a lot with livestock. I uh, uh, I played basketball and football, but then I broke my leg in football my junior year. And that sort of ended my football career. But it was one of these things that was a lucky break because uh, when they did the x-rays, they found a cyst on one of my bones. So they took six inches of bone from my hip and grafted it on where they removed the cyst. And therefore... Interesting surgical procedure when you think about it, huh? Oh, at that time especially. Oh, oh yes, yes. And so... uh, uh, it it was really funny. My father was a little upset about that because I was really a hired hand on the farm. Uh, my father always said that uh, 
in town a kid was a mouth and out on the farm they were a hand and he believed that and so he was concerned about who was going to you know do my chores and all of that and of course I was on crutches he arranged for the tractor that was assigned to me uh, that he was able to put a hand clutch on it and he put a place for me to extend my my leg that was in a cast and later it was you know in a brace so that I'd still be able to drive that tractor and operate the brakes by hand it was <laughs> early you know handicap no. uh, treatment disability and keep continue with remote and, controls and continue that's right uh, my father helps. was very mechanically inclined that's uh, pretty good. my parents immigrated from Germany from the Schleswig Holstein area and my father came first in 1926 and then in 1928 he went back got married brought my mother back and uh, he had uh, first farmed with a person in in Clinton Iowa to pay for his ticket and then uh, uh, when he got through with that he went with several other people from Germany and intercepted the people who were doing the grain harvest in Kansas and this group would just follow the the grain ripening and and they had a thrasher and wagons and and they went through Nebraska and when he got into South Dakota they heard about the Homestead gold mine in Leeds, South Dakota and so they uh, as dad said they made a left-hand turn and and he became a miner. Uh, he did that for several years, and obviously when they came back, the stock market had crashed in that year. And uh, he worked a lot of odd jobs until he finally got back into the mine. And he did this until 1934, when he stopped mining because he broke his leg and started farming went back to Nebraska. To, to yeah. Nebraska. Yeah. And it was only because we had some relation on my mother's side of the family that they were close by. Yeah. And so uh, uh, he said his timing was never good because, you know, 1934 was the start of the Dust Bowl. And so uh, all of these experiences of the Depression and the Dust Bowl and that were really, you know, ingrained in the conversation in the conversations that we had at home and and also just the managing of money and sure. all of that so it's that close it, at hand you learned a lot I learned a lot right really yeah. did right and after what came after high school then well uh, let me just comment on high school okay uh, a couple additional things um, I had several uh, teachers that really influenced me uh, there was a couple, uh, Sterling uh, Van Vleck, who taught history and was my basketball coach, and uh, his wife, Lou, who taught typing. And they were our class sponsors. And uh, they were, when, when they suddenly assessed our class, which was 48 students, they realized that not many of us had any aspirations of going on to college, and uh, had they been to college? Had they they had been to college, okay. and they knew the importance of that. And so, uh, what happened was that uh, 44 of the 48 students went on to college because of that couple, and they worked not only with us as students but with the parents in encouraging why they should go off sure. to college. They serve an advisory role or counseling, which many schools today, you know, offer that. Right. And that's, so that was quite an influence because uh, the year, the class the year before, there were only five students that went off to college. That's how much of an impact they had. Sure. And I was fortunate to uh, had seen them at one of our class anniversaries and, and uh, you know, really thanked them for what sure. they had done. That's nice. The other person was uh, Vernon Walgren, who was my vocational agriculture instructor. And through him I learned leadership, 
because you learn all these principles of Robert's Rules and, and that with you know, the FFA part of it, and then also record keeping. So they were, you know, really important people to me at, at an early stage. And right. of course, I also got encouragement from home that I probably ought to get a degree, and so I went off to the University of Nebraska. <laughs> Tell us a bit more. Who wanted to tell us about that? Well, I was thinking, you know, that I wanted to major in vocational agriculture because of, you know, that influence, of my, you know, on my life at that time. And everything went fine for about a semester. And then in the second semester, they mentioned this thing about lesson plans and, and curriculum. And, and I thought, this isn't what I really expected. And uh, I had... I was taking an agronomy course at that time, and so I talked to several people in agronomy, and then all of a sudden I, I switched to agronomy and, and uh, really decided on soil conservation as my major. Mm -hmm. And of course that influenced a lot of things in my career. My father was very, very oriented toward soil conservation. He was on the uh, Soil and Water Conservation Board for the for our county. Uh, he was the first person to uh, receive an award for soil conservation from the Omaha World Herald. They gave an outstanding conservationist award each year. And so Very nice. that, you know, that left an impression sure. with me as well. So uh, it, it, was, it was great in that uh, so many of the instructors, I, I remember uh, uh, People like uh, oh, uh, James V. Drew, he was my, my advisor. He also became my mentor for my master's degree. And Jim and I became very close friends. And uh, we were both in the Air National Guard and we did a lot of things together and he became Dean of Agriculture in Alaska. And so, you know, still stayed in, in touch with him there. Sure. Uh, another person was Milo Cox, who was a Texan that ended up in, in Nebraska. And he taught me a lot about uh, plants, which was really important. And Wayne Kime, his father uh, uh, was uh, honored as an outstanding agronomist, and our building was called Kime Hall. So, uh, is that the same Wayne Kime that was that was here? Was here? That came here. Right. <laughs> I interviewed him when he was here for the uh, anniversary. Oh, yeah. excellent! Yes, and excellent. that's why I got a chance to meet both oh. he and his wife, and he got one of those uh, new awards that were given. right, right. That. Uh, and I have a standing invitation. If you get out there, you're welcome to drop in. I said, "Well, I never know when I'm going to." You never know. Right. You never exactly. know. No, yeah. Wayne. Uh, isn't that what a small I've, world? It, it is a small world. So I knew his father quite well, and he was an instructor of mine. Uh -huh. uh, but Wayne was as well as a graduate student sure. at that time. So, uh, And then there was a person by the name of uh, Robert Olson who uh, taught in soils that was just such a wonderful person. He, uh, uh, he just had an interesting way of making, you know, soils be real, and, and that, that had an influence on me. Sure. So, okay. we really enjoyed uh, uh, Nebraska, uh, particularly the, you know, the life on the campus. I belonged to a fraternity, Alpha Gamma Sigma. I met my wife there, who uh, uh, had belonged to uh, Kappa, Del Kappa Delta sorority, and so you know, there were lots of activities uh, in that way, but we went to a lot of their convocations and movies and that type of thing, so football games was always important in Nebraska, and so... Uh, oh, really? It, I didn't know. <laughs> first time I heard that. First time, first time you ever heard that, right. Uh, um. But after I had... Uh, uh, I finished my degree... Uh, in 1959 in May and I, uh, I'd been working for the Soil Conservation Service as a student trainee each summer 
and since I got my degree, I went on with them full time in a neighboring town by the name of Beatrice. And Joe, uh, my wife, actually we got married that summer. After you graduated? After we graduated. But she still had a semester left on her degree, and her degree was in elementary ed. Uh, so I decided I would go ahead and, and take some courses that I had never, you know, that I wanted to take but never Not had even. a chance to. So I signed up for uh, 16 hours of graduate courses, and I hadn't realized till later that that was an awful load. I mean, you know, normally eight was about the max. So I had twice the maximum. And I did really well. I paid my own way, and before the semester was over, why they offered me an assistantship, and uh, I was hooked. I stayed on for my master's. Okay. And uh, lucky thing, I you know had Jim Drew to fall back on, and he involved me in the course on soil genesis and morphology, or the study of the derivation of soils. And this was uh, a, a really a great experience for me. I, I had uh, all these uh, vets that came back from the Korean War, that were showing up on a campus, and and it was great being around a, a group like that. Sure. So uh, eager to learn and to play catch up. Exactly. Knew exactly like the what they came wanted back to from do. World War Two. They just they had a short short window. Yes. Yes. Exactly. So, so that was really you know the the whole the Nebraska scene. But you know after that, I had um, uh, I thought about. Uh, looking at a commercial company and a friend of uh, Dr. Drew's had uh, shown up on a campus that was with Chevron Chemical Company and Dr. Drew being quite astute uh, <clears throat> asked me to take uh, his friend back to the airport and on the way to the airport I guess I had my interview and uh, was offered a job as an area agronomist and uh, the area agronomist position, though, couldn't be set up right away, so they put me in sales for six months. And that actually taught me a lot about how to sell yourself. You know, if you couldn't sell yourself, you couldn't sell the product that you had. And so there was an important lesson there that in paid six off. months' time that really paid off. Sure. And then after that, I was transferred to uh, Richmond, Indiana, and I covered Indiana, Ohio, and Kentucky as an area agronomist. And, you know, after a year, uh, the white horse you're riding, you know, sort of gets gray hair. It, it becomes a drag because you're gone all during the week, and, you know, here I was married and only had the weekends, and sometimes I was working weekends and, and that type of thing. And so... I was already thinking I need to do something else. And I was attending a conference here at Purdue on, uh, uh, it was a soil, it was a fertilizer and chemical conference. And Dr. J.B. Peterson was in the overall uh, coordinator of the conference. <clears throat> and before one of the breaks, he'd announced that he had a position open as a land use extension specialist here at Purdue. And, uh, dismissed everybody and we went out and had coffee and and I happened to bump into Dr. Peterson who I had met because I'd gone into his office several times to at least acquaint him with our company and myself and it turned out that he remembered me and said oh he said you have the right sort of background for the position I announced are you interested and I said well I'm sort of but you know I'm doing well in the company and he said, well, if, you're, if you change your mind, let me know. <clears throat> and just then someone walked up and said, there's a phone message for you on the uh, bulletin board. So I went to the bulletin board, and it happened to be my boss's number, so I called him. And his secretary said, he needs to see you right away. Can you be here tomorrow? And I said, well, I can even from here drive tonight to Toledo, which is where his office was. So... I drove to Toledo, and the next morning I was in my boss's office, and he told me to sit down 
And as I sat down, he said, you've lost your job. And I said, how did I do that? And he says, well, we hired 12 of you, and we didn't know how to, the, the top people in the company didn't know how to evaluate what you were doing. With sales reps, you take the amount that they've sold and you subtract their salary and expenses and you have a net worth. And he said, with you guys, there wasn't anything to subtract from your salary and expenses. And it was an important lesson right there. You know, always let your boss know what you're worth. So I remembered that. And on the way home from that, I was thinking about what am I going to tell Joe about what's happened. And I was going through a small town and there was a phone booth and it clicked. I need to call Dr. Peterson. So I stopped at the phone booth and I finally got uh, his number and, and dialed it and uh, he answered. And I identified myself and I said, you know, Dr. Peterson, I'm interested. And he said, good, you're hired. And this was in the days when... <laughs> Those things did occur. Really. Those things did occur. Right. But it was interesting in my conversations with Dr. Peterson earlier, he, had, uh, he was interested in that I uh, had studied at the University of Nebraska and, and he was good friends with Dr. Hanway, the department head there. And, uh, so you knew a little bit about what had been going on in the curriculum courses it, and whatever. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And he had also, the second time I went to see him, he just asked me for my resume, and I gave it to him. Sure. Never thinking that this would lead to something. So that's how I got to Purdue. Okay, good. And uh, uh, it was kind of fun then driving home, and I had the best good news, bad news story that people could have. <laughs> right, it worked out. It worked out. Nice. Right. So you relocated here. Where did where did you live when you first came here? Uh, did you have any children at that time? No, oh, no. Okay. And we lived over in Lafayette. Okay. We moved into a house that was vacated by uh, Donald Post. Don had just received his Ph.D. here at Purdue in agronomy, and so uh, uh, I got a chance to get acquainted with him. And even through the years, I've I kept in touch. He's still on our Christmas list. So uh, uh, we moved into a, a national home. Uh, so uh, uh, it was a rental property. And uh, uh, a, a quick note on that, we stayed in that house until uh, 1971. In December, we had bought a house here in, on Grant Street. And then we left here in August of 72, so we hadn't been in the house a year before, you know, we end up having, having to sell it. But, sure. but anyway, that started my uh, career here at Purdue first as, as a uh, extension agronomist in land use, and then uh, uh, I had sort of a change in life experience there in that one of my instructors uh, Robert Miles in civil engineering taught photo interpretation and I uh, uh, always stayed afterwards to look at a lot of photographs and that that he had on display and, and he came up to me one day and he said you really like this don't you and I said oh I said I could do this for a living of interpreting photography. He was doing that photos? Was he doing them? Okay. He was he was teaching that mainly for civil engineering students sure. but I was taking civil engineering courses thinking that I wanted more information related to how engineers looked at soils so that I could also help with non-agricultural land use as well as agricultural land use and uh, then uh, Professor Miles said you know there is a group out in the research park that has a uh, NASA grant to look at photography from space and he said you ought to go talk to him so I went out and talked to him and and they offered me a job and I, we were able to work it out there was a research instructorship to agronomy 
and I was able to continue with coursework toward a PhD mm -hmm. and uh, uh, it took me a little little oh, longer, sure. than, right. but at the same time uh, I was able to then do my research on a topic of, of remote sensing. And we define remote sensing as, as any uh, uh, way that you can look at an object and observe it without touching it. So, you know, your, your eyes are a type of sensor, but our trick was to, to use sensors that were developed to measure light reflectance and then also thermal and the, the Laboratory for Applications of Remote Sensing, or LARS, actually started out as a laboratory for agricultural remote sensing. But after two years, we changed the name from agriculture to applications because we wanted a broader view. It was difficult to get money from the U.S. Geological Survey when you had the name agriculture in your name, just as an example. And so Lars uh, became, you know, an, an important group on this campus. We were actually out in the research park, but many of the people that... It was really called that, McClure at that time, wasn't it? Or was, was it called the research park? It was, used, it was just the... Research park. It was already called the Purdue Research yeah. Park at that early time. Days, early early on, that... Right, I remember that. Not many that people don't recall it, but I remember hearing about that. But it, it, as long as I've been here and you've been here, it's been a research park. Okay. Uh, well. It's grown. It was a lot smaller. Oh, the, I mean, the changes that have occurred out yeah. there. Oh, yeah. Now, it was interesting that uh, because we had such strong funding uh, from NASA, we, uh, we were also uh, a NASA test site because early on we established the agronomy farm as our test site, and then we added on to that the Martell Forest, which was just directly south of the agronomy farm, so that the flight lines could come over the agronomy farm and then catch the forest area, and then we just extended it all the way to West Point, Indiana, which went down the Granville Road. The Granville Road was very important because pilots could focus on that Granville Road and then go straight across and connect with roads up past the agronomy farm. And uh, this became, every time NASA had a different sensor that they wanted to evaluate, they flew our test site, and of course we got early data to be able to look at it. There was another thing that we had done, and that was that most of the data that NASA was thinking about collecting would have been in the video format and not in a digital format. So it would have been in an analog format and not digital. We started out digitizing analog signals to be able to work with computers in a digital format. And we had one of the first IBM 360s uh, that we had obtained under our NASA contract. So we had one of the larger computers here at Purdue at the time that that took up a, a room that was huge because you needed so you much of that too. air conditioning, you know, as well as... <clears throat> that was also a, a very interesting experience with Lars because Lars was an interdisciplinary group. We had engineers, we had uh, geologists that actually came from the Civil Engineering Department, and later we added geographers from Indiana State University and formed a good relationship with them. We had forestry people, we had, you know, all the different disciplines. At one time we had something like 17 different departments involved in Lars. And so we were really the beginning of what Purdue looked at as an interdisciplinary like activity and and how to really make that work. And so uh, I grew up with that sort of thing as part of my education, of, you know, working with many different disciplines, and I, I found that was, that was extremely sure. important. Well, uh, what's the size of the facility out there? Was it we, uh, adequate or? Well, 
When did, then did you move to, did you stay out there for a while? We stayed out there until 1985. Oh. And we, we first had the, uh, it's one of the first buildings that, I'm trying to think of the name of it right now, it was called Flex Lab One at the time. And uh, uh, it it's has another name. Near, between State Farm and Channel 18, somewhere along that's the right, area. That's right, that's right. And they had developed another uh, Flex Lab 2, and we eventually took over most of that. So it was it, fairly close into where that other one was. And that's that where the um, uh, business development group right. started, right there along, uh, right. close by, away from Jaeger Road and mm -hmm. Cumberland. Anyway, uh, at one time we had about 130 employees. And so, you know, it was a large group. And we were known internationally because we were teaching workshops for anyone that would pay the price for uh, the teaching. And we, we set it up that it could be one week, it could be two weeks. You could come for a month, six months, or even a year, depending upon what type of training you wanted. And so uh, we had people from many different countries, and later on in my career, I kept running into people that had trained here at Purdue when they found out I was from Purdue. Yeah, that's that was nice. kind of neat. <laughs> that is nice. It's nice to run to have that happen. I think. Yes, yes. Yeah. So. Is that then? Do you want to switch? Uh, then you left, went to Columbia. I went right. Yeah. It was one of those things that uh, one day I was. Uh, you know, I'd always been interested in land use. And I got to thinking about the fact that, you know, here I had my PhD and I was uh, on, the, on the faculty here at Purdue and I was teaching a, a course, but at the same time I was referred to as Dan Wiersma's graduate student. And I decided I wanted to get out on my own. And uh, I'll come back to that teaching in a moment. But mm -hmm. I, uh, I went off and, and started doing some interviewing just to see what might be available and was offered a, a really good position at the University of Missouri. And so in 1972, I, uh, that's where we went. Mm -hmm. And I was the state extension agronomy specialist in land use. They, it was a brand new position. And so it was up to me to develop that. And I, uh, I approached it from the standpoint of uh, I wanted to also do some remote sensing, which they had encouraged me. But I was interested in the soils aspect, and so I was responsible for the soil survey program, particularly the educational part of that. I was responsible for soil conservation. And that was, you know, another part of me that was really that I was really interested in and then the remote sensing part of it and of course immediately why I started writing proposals and, and getting some funding on my own and, and hiring some people to you know assist in that and so uh, uh, this led to uh, uh, some interest on the part of electrical engineering uh, at the University of Missouri to start a center. And uh, they wanted something like Lars because they knew about Lars. And so a good friend of mine, uh, who was a department head there in electrical engineering and I got together and, and uh, we developed the Geographic Resources Center, which later on was moved over into the geography department and is still a very active center. We focused on uh, activities uh, that largely came out of the extension staff in Missouri because they had gone to a regional uh, offices where uh, a person had to have uh, a master's or a PhD to be involved as uh, an extension person and uh, this was really the you know the, the door the open door to the university sure. and Purdue's adopted that same approach, and so have many other land-grant universities. But 
it was interesting being part of that type of experience because I would get projects that people became interested in and uh, would start developing those and, and uh, received lots of funding from NASA and, and uh, other sources. And so, you know, had my own graduate students. Uh, uh, I did not teach uh, any uh, courses there, but my appointment was largely that of extension and, and research. It was during that time that I really got interested in the uh, uh, Soil and Water Conservation Society, and uh, that led to lots of activity with them, and we'll cover that probably sure. in, in, in a little bit. But okay. I wanted to get back a moment to a course that I had taught here at Purdue, and uh, it was a uh, uh, course on contamination of air, soil, and water. I'm trying to remember the, uh, uh, oh, it was Agronomy 490, and it's it's still being taught. And uh, <clears throat> I taught it on campus, and uh, here. here, and they got interested, uh, several people, about could we teach that on the Indiana higher, uh, the, the IHATS. Uh, higher education television system and uh, we advertised it and all of a sudden I had 120 students at nine different locations and uh, I would it was every Tuesday night for three hours and it was it was a ball uh, the uh, TV crew uh, worked with me on going out and filming different land use uh, anytime I found a film or uh, some type of video that had something on it, they would help me to incorporate that into the lectures. I used lots of slides, and, and uh, it was fun. Uh, it was even dubbed the Agricultural Tonight Show. I, I just really had a great time with, with, with that. What was interesting about it is, though, I never saw my students. You didn't have any here on this campus at all? Not live in, in, oh, in the, the studio. studio. Huh. It was, uh, but... So they were on campus, but they weren't in the studio. They weren't, they weren't even on campus. Oh, okay. They were located in, in, in different universities. I had uh, Indiana University, I had Ball State, uh, IUPUI, uh, and then some extension centers. And so there were nine locations, as I mentioned, and uh, somebody there, usually it was a county extension agent, that would field the questions and if there was a question, they would push a button and a red light would go on a studio. And if, when I saw the red light, I would say, someone has a question. And they would introduce themselves and then I'd get the question and we'd talk about that. And that really you know, led to a, a lot of other things that you know, from there I was not afraid to do uh, TV and interviews. You got launched. And, I got launched. I really did. And that, you know, helped out sure. tremendously in my extension program at the University of Missouri. I even carried a uh, recorder with me and uh, would do interviews with people and bring them back and they played those over the radio, at the university radio station. And so... Uh, like WBAA. Right, exactly. And so uh, uh, that was just another one of those really interesting things. And then, you know, one day on campus, uh, Eldon Fredericks, who was here in, uh, he was head of agricultural communications, I bumped into him on the campus, just walking along the street. And, and in Missouri? Yes. And I said, what are you doing here? <clears throat> and he said, I'm looking for someone to um, direct our agricultural data network. And I said, Oh, uh, and he said, you want to have a cup of coffee? And I said, sure. So we went and had a cup of coffee, and that was my interview for becoming director of the Agricultural Data Network. Here. Here at Purdue. So that was in 1985, so I came back to Purdue, which leads me to the point that Dr. Peterson had always said, whenever you leave a place, never burn your bridges. 
always leave in the best graces, graces. And so, you know, it was good advice because when I came back, I, uh, I remember one of the faculty members saying, Chris, in six months, people are going to forget that you were even gone. And it was that way. I mean, it just, you were, you know, accepted right and it just moved right back into right. doing things. The Ag Cultural Data Network was really the an extension arm of, of setting up computers out in all the uh, extension centers and also involving the state extension specialist in writing programs that county agents could use. And uh, we had a staff of, of about 12 people that helped in writing that software and helped in keeping these computers going and sure. keeping the email moving and it was really my first experience with email. And so uh, I realized though after a couple of years that uh, this was a fun group to work with but I didn't understand enough of the computer part of it. I was not a computer science individual and that they really needed someone that understood that because they were ready to go on to do models of computer and and get... They needed more of that expertise along that line. Exactly. And so right at that time, uh, uh, Marion Baumgartner, who was director of Lars at the time, had decided that he wanted to step down. And so... Uh, I had taken over Lars, and I was doing that in addition to the Ag Data Network for a year or two, and then you know decided that no, I've I've, I've got an opportunity that I better do the Lars thing more full time. But at the, at the same time, what happened was uh, I was approached whether I would help start an institute, and the we decided after getting faculty members together to start the Natural National Natural Resources Research Institute. Mm -hmm. But after a year or two, the faculty decided we needed the word environment in there, and so that's when we started the Environmental Science and Engineering Institute, which, you know, is now the Environment Center here, here at Purdue. And so, uh, uh, or the Center for Environment, they call it the E4 group. And that was really an interesting experience in that uh, I spent a lot of time bringing ideas to faculty about opportunities for writing proposals and getting the right people together and uh, keeping, you know, business offices and that involved and in all of those sort of things. But... Uh, uh, I, I also found that uh, I, I kept looking around to see if there might be, you know, some other opportunities for me, and and then you know I I have to admit that I was my my stay here at Purdue was really two parts. That first part was my office was in entomology, and agronomy was over in the life science building, so. I would come over for staff meetings and seminars, but I had no office there. And then in uh, uh, 1996, I uh, gave up the institute, still decided to keep the Lars directorship. And uh, at that time, I moved from entomology over to agronomy. And uh, that was much better because at that time, you know, I was really accepted then as as an agronomy person, and I was uh, teaching agronomy uh, 545, which is uh, remote sensing of land resources, a course that Dr. Baumgartner had started. And uh, uh, I really enjoyed that very much because uh, I was watching the uh, news all the time. See, the course was taught in the fall, and I would watch for hurricanes because tracking hurricanes was one of the the most significant remote sensing application you could find at that time. 
and there were plenty of hurricanes. And so uh, I would always start the lecture with showing what the latest hurricane was. And, and students sort of thought that this was, you know, the uh, opening enjoyment, you know, for them. But they soon found that they needed to learn something about what sensors were being used because that always came up on the exams. And so uh, <laughs> the word got passed on though, pretty right. quickly to, to right. people. Yeah, right. So I, I really became an expert then in, in putting PowerPoint presentations together and being able to uh, you know, develop those uh, type of methodologies. And I, I found that uh, teaching uh, uh, 545 that uh, it really uh, kept me up with the latest things that were going on in remote sensing. But I uh, 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 always had to, I could never use the same lecture each year, each fall. I'd have to go back in and pick out, you know, the latest things that had developed because the technologies changing, were, were right. changing so fast. Right. I had also at that time started a, uh, a research program in uh, precision ag culture using remote sensing in precision ag culture. And precision ag culture was one of those things that was, farmers were interested in every spot in a field as to how to increase production. And if you could look at that with satellite data and be able to show them the size of an area that was affected, they, you know, became very interested in. Because I have yet to have a farmer tell me that they didn't realize how large the area was that was of concern to them. They always thought it was smaller than, but, you know, there's a lot more there. And so uh, I started recruiting graduate students that were older, uh, at least over 30. And uh, uh, it was great. Here were people that had been out in industry or had been out on a job with an organization that wanted more training and they knew what they wanted and so I never had to sit down and tell somebody that they need to take statistics because they you know they came to me and already had it down and and I became really close colleagues with with these people too uh, somebody sat down and figured out that the average age of my group was 37 at one time and uh, I had up to 11 graduate students one year enough for a football team or at least to put 12 men out of them. No, 11, I had 11. But at the same time, this group really developed some interesting results that we really published a lot of papers. And so, you know, it became pretty well known for that type of expertise, which we went to many professional meetings I had insisted to NASA and others who were funding me that I needed funding for taking results to meetings and getting my students to those meetings as well so they could get that experience at a professional meeting. And so having belonged to many uh, professional societies, there were many of them that not only were we going to, but the students were exposed to a lot of those. And, these students now are, some are working for NASA, some are working for the State Department, uh, some are in private industry. Uh, it's great, you know, particularly to, I, I really feel that, you know, one's legacy is the students that you train. And so uh, I've, I've even had uh, uh, some people stop by that now are students of my students. and. I call them my scientific grandchildren. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Yes, you did get um, I'll leave it up to you, guys. I thought maybe you might, you were, I'm sure, talk about that ecology logistics. That, uh, oh, company. yes, yes. You know, one of the uh, things that uh, I got involved in lots of professional societies. and, yeah, and saw that uh, resume, right. I, uh, I made it a I made it a point to uh, become involved in every society that, that I joined. 
And this is part of the interdisciplinary aspect of things. I needed something in remote sensing. I needed something in soil conservation. I needed something in soils. And, you know, that's where that all started. And so uh, at the soil and water conservation uh, meetings, I uh, developed a, a, a friendship with a person from Canada, uh, David uh, Cressman, who owned a company called Ecologistics. And I became president of that society, and David became president a year later. And so we worked very closely together. And then he convinced me to start a U.S. version of his company here in uh, uh, West Lafayette, and we located it in the research park. And it was essentially an environmental consulting firm. Uh, there was another... Uh, president that followed him uh, by the name of Maurice Cook, who was from North Carolina, and we started another office in, in North Carolina. And I uh, served as director, and we had lots of projects, uh, not only here around the state, but, uh, you know, in, in other states. Uh, we, we did a number of things uh, in Mississippi and worked on different environmental projects, writing environmental impact statements and that. And then as I approached retirement, I got to thinking about what I wanted to do in retirement. And I decided that I didn't want to write proposals for other people so they'd have money to do work. Not that, you know, that isn't important, but... But this is another stage. That You're was another... Stage. I was reaching a stage that I wanted to get away from that. And so my wife and I decided to sell the company, and, and uh, we sold it, and we're really happy that, you know, that we did that. Right. So uh, uh, the, uh, the experience, by the way, of being president of the Soil and Water Conservation Society was just one of those really fun things that, that I did in my professional career because... We, uh, we changed the name from the Soil Conservation Society to the Soil and Water Conservation Society because we wanted to get a broader group into the society. We did increase our membership. We had about thirteen to 14,000 members at that time. And uh, uh, it, was, it was really one of those Im important types of things that that you're involved in it, and you know, and it, it, you're able to get it, you know, you realize the value and be able to implement it. Right. One of the things that a president can do is offer an award called a presidential citation, and you can give that to 12 people that helped you a lot during your time when you're president. I expanded that to mean, you know, during your whole career, and my first award I gave to my father. And, uh, uh, it's the first time I ever saw tears in his eyes. <laughs> that was really fun, giving him that award. Right. Uh, so uh, made it extra special. It it really made it extra special. Right. Yeah. And being the first one, that's and, even and right, right. That's so right. Uh, you got quite a few awards. That's going to uh, a couple of them. I thought you might want to highlight, but I thought that. Agronomy Achievement Award. That's that uh, most recent one that you. That's got. the most recent one, and that. I sort of look at that one as a career award, uh, and it, it's nice to have you know your own department honor right. you with with that type of an award. That's that's uh, not a new award though. It's been given in the past. It's been it? given in okay. the past. Okay. Uh, they started that about ten years ago. Okay. And so uh, uh, each year they give out four awards, and you have to be an alumnus of the of the department sure. and I qualified there because I've got my PhD here so <laughs> uh, but you know I, I also still main, maintain a fairly active uh, career my my wife has told everybody that I've flunked retirement I uh, and I have because I do consulting I go to the office frequently I'm, I'm a co-editor of the journal terrestrial observation and you know. Did you uh, did you opt to go full retirement, or were you on half time before you retired? No, I went full. Oh, okay. Yeah, 
Okay. I, I, but you, you planned for it. I planned for you it. You have to. You oh, just can't turn. You just can't. No. I, and I didn't want to walk away from it. And I told that yeah, to my you department put so much head. Of, you put so much of your yourself into your career. So That's that right. It's key. One of the things that I'm really proudest of is that I learned how to keep connections. And every time I would go to a conference or a meeting, I would meet people and I'd pick up their card and I would make notes about them of some of their interests or, you know, names of their kids or, sure. you know, that sort of thing. And so I, I kept record of that. And uh, I, I still today, you know, have about 2,000 uh, addresses and contacts. And I'm frequently asked by people, do you know of someone that I need to find someone that can do such and such a job? Or I need somebody to review my paper? or that sort of thing. And so I've been recognized as a person that has that sort of connectivity. And I still keep that up today. I, uh, so far this week, I've had two people ask me, you know, for a connection like that. It's like the, uh, you have a lot of expertise and people value that and they, they tend to, you're a good resource. And, yes. and they value, other times people don't realize that you come from a long way and you really have a lot of background knowledge that you can share. I'd, and and that's neat. And you're, and it's and you're all glad over. to share. I'm really glad to share. That's right. And, uh, you know, I've, I've maintained a very uh, uh, special contact with international people because I've done a lot of travel. I've been in over 50 countries that I've work, worked in and had projects. And uh, that, you know, is, is another part of my life that I've really enjoyed. And my wife and I still do uh, travel. And we take our kids with us. I was going to ask you about family. Do you have, um, did your children come to Purdue? You have children. I have, we have two boys. Uh, Eric, the oldest, uh, came to uh, Purdue. He came to Purdue at the same time that we did. He made up his mind that he was coming here to study chemical engineering. Uh, he, he really, though, had in mind ever since the third grade that he wanted to be an MD, but he decided engineering was, you know, the way to go with that. And he chose Purdue because we had been here and talked so much about it. And uh, then he was almost upset when we came here, but he maintained his own, own life. and. and after he uh, finished here, he went to the University of Chicago and did an MA in social sciences because... Did he do his chemical engineering here? Oh, yeah, yes. He did. Yes. He did. Okay. yes. And he was named the outstanding student here uh, in chemical engineering that year that he graduated. Uh, and he even told the dean of engineering uh, that he was a little upset that the only thing he learned was engineering. And the dean said, well, you should have told us and we could have extended your time and you could have taken some of these other courses and he said but you never told me that and, <laughs> and I thought that you know that it was great that Dean shared that with me you know I learned something about my son that way anyway uh, Eric went on to Harvard got an MD there and uh, oh his, his doctor uh, MD medical MD. medical MD and but got involved in research there. And he's now an expert in Epstein-Barr syndrome, and uh, they have uh, really made some significant advances there, and he's got a good research group, and he's well-funded. He uh, uh, m married, uh, Sally uh, is, is a great partner because she has a, uh, a degree uh, in, uh, She's a physician's assistant, and she likes emergency room types of things, and so they're a busy couple. But there are two granddaughters. Uh, Kaylee is three, and Abby's a year and a half, and uh, uh, so we get out to Boston sure. fairly frequently. Youngest son is uh, a uh, person who is more of a social scientist and 
that he went to St. Olaf College, got a degree in theater, and then when he found out he had a difficult time making a living in theater, he uh, got a degree in law at William and Mitchell school. College there in uh, Minneapolis. And then uh, he's now with uh, the legal department of Ameriprise and is doing very well. Yeah. He uh, is not married, and uh, but you know his work is very much consuming and sure. well, that's good. it's fun to get them together and we've had a number of trips like to uh, France, to Italy, England, you know, and now we have to wait until the granddaughters get a little older before we do, you know, those sort of things sure. again. But uh, we still get together each year and, and we'll rent a place for a couple of weeks and, and just nice. have a good time. Yeah, that's good. That's, that's nice. Um, and we talked about, I'll talk about university activity, uh, the Retirees Association. You are the president-elect. That's right. <laughs> and you probably know that Dr. Hansen is the one that started that organization. Yes, yeah. yes. Right. And uh, uh, it's a wonderful organization. I mean, we really it's changed stand up over for the. Time. It's changed over time. Right. We are very interested in, in the benefits that one can receive as being a Purdue retiree. Yeah, and that's, a, that's key. That's today. key. Right. It's also key that we. I just learned this morning that our retirees have averaged over this past 10 years $4,900,000 in contributions to Purdue. Just from people that are, quote, retirees. That What's the size of that organization now? Do you have a feel for it? Oh, it's about 6,000 people. Uh, Immediately here within a nine county area, there's about uh, 14, 1,500, something like that. Good. And so it's it's a good group. And you have a lot of activities, and I've interviewed some people who've been involved with it, and it's. We do a lot of volunteer work. Uh, the volunteer work is significant. All right, you've the, got your the, people at the Visitors Information Center and also over in the DASH. Right. right. Yeah, and that's nice. And you know, the the a lot of them volunteer for ushering at convocation, sure, and sure. and even you know, in the place where they had worked, they go back and right. <coughs> do special types of things. And so, uh, it's it's a very interesting organization, and I'm I'm having a lot of fun. You know, the. I, I start next June, and that year is going to go very, very fast for me, I'm sure. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> uh, one other word I was going to make a comment. I think that the Certificate of Achievement from the Ag Alumni Association is nice. Did you get that at the – you going to go to the fish fry this year? Uh, yes, I don't okay. miss the fish fry. It's, uh, it's just well, one of those uh, places that you connect with again. <laughs> I should tell you that I just recently, last Friday, as a matter of fact, I interviewed a Oh, so, excellent. And he's, I know he, and, and I have done... Have you uh, done I, Phil? I, I, yes, I did him okay. too. So, uh, Phil Nelson yeah, is and, also... Uh, he told great. me that uh, we were walking down the steps. I did a video with him, and he told me that he just heard that Senator Luger's also going to be there. So it should yes. be a good program. Oh, it yeah. will be. Yeah, it right. will be. And, and uh, I said... I heard that you were tall. He said, well, I said, well, you're a little taller than I am. <laughs> and he is a little bit tall. He is tall. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, they go to our church, and so, okay. you know, we really know them sure, personally. Oh, sure. And so this this has just been wonderful. And he's been very helpful with, I've, I've done a number of projects in Africa. Uh-huh. And I've really yes, relied, right. really relied on Kabisa to, you know, assist me with some things. And sure. He's been a, a great mentor in, in that respect because there's uh, a thing early on that I learned. When you go to countries, you're a guest, and you need to learn something about the culture uh, so that you don't offend people when you're there and try to learn as much as you can. Do your homework. Do your homework, and uh, I've, I've done a lot of that. And so... Uh, well, we've got, uh, I'm leaving it up to you. Did, we, did I miss anything? One of the things uh, is, were there any traditions that we liked here at Purdue? And I would say that uh, one tradition that my wife and I always enjoyed was commencement. Because every time one of my students graduated, 
I would volunteer as a faculty member to uh, be part of that commencement and we would invite my students, parents, and family to come to our house afterwards for a meal and, and uh, you know, just have a celebration of our own. And we always had a gift for the graduate. And uh, that was just one of those little traditions that now I, I really miss. But what is also interesting is that many times the family would stay at our house because with our sons gone, we have plenty of room. And the students all know this, and when they're in town, uh, if we aren't home, they know where the key to the house is, and they make themselves at home. And it's kind of neat. It's nice. When they feel that much as, as part of the family. That's right. And so that's where I said they, they really become, you know, friends and colleagues. So, and that's uh, important. Right. And it's long, right. long standing, too. It's, it's really long standing, right, right. So. Did you have an outstanding event that you wanted to one come to your mind? One that really comes to my mind is when I received the Hugh Hammett Bennett Award. Uh, one I wasn't expecting it. That's the, uh, it's really the outstanding soil conservation award that you could, could achieve internationally. And uh, uh, all of our family was there and they surprised me. I mean, my wife arranged for them to be there, and so here they were when I got that. That was, that was a special That's event. Special. My life. Yeah. It's, I often ask people if they're surprised, and they say yes, and I think it's neat to be surprised. Yeah. I think it is. Yeah, yeah. So and we got every, and do you think we're I I think, yeah. Okay. I mean, okay. I'm enjoying retirement. Good. There's, Good. I mean, we're taking time off for retirement. Sure. We play golf and those sort of things. So. Okay, thank you very much. I've got oh, a couple of comments.